welcome everyone. I'm Josefine Westborg and I'm here to talk about learning through a cognitive perspective and how this can be relevant for using analog role-playing games in the classroom. What is a role-playing game? Bowman put it, role-playing games are co-creative experiences where participants immerse into fictional characters and realities for a bounded period of time through emergent playfulness. I really like this uh, definition, but I will also add that focus is on participating and not on performance. It's about creating and exploring a narrative together. And even though they can be digital, today we will focus on analog role-playing games. Role-playing games are huge right now with Kickstarters drawing in millions of dollars. And role-playing games can be seen as a cultural context in their own might with tabletop games such as Dungeons and Dragons or in LARPs, uh, live action role-playing games all over the world. But it can also be seen in other mediums like web series such as Critical Role or podcasts like Red Moon Role-Playing. Often role-playing games are used in leisure settings, but today, it's about role-playing games in educational settings. When looking at educational role-playing games research, a lot of the research I found focus on the experience of students or of the teacher's experience. The cognitive perspective isn't as common in approaching role-playing games. And when it's used, focus is on cognitive skills and motivation, but I haven't found anything that tries to explain what is actually happening in the cognitive structures when learning in relation to role-playing games. One of the most classical problems in educational psychology is the transfer problem. Transfer is when you apply what you have learned in one context in another different context. And this is something we as humans are pretty bad at. So what can help with this and how is this connected to role-playing games? Well, to get there, we have to start with memory and how this works. In cognitive science, our memory is often described as being built up by two main parts, the long-term memory and the working memory. The long-term memory is the storage. That's where we keep all the things we have learned in cognitive structures called schemas. The capacity of the long-term memory is huge and there is no clear answer to what the upper limit is yet. The working memory can be thought of as the processor of our brain. This is where we sort out all the info that comes in and either send it to be kept in the long-term memory or sort it out to not be relevant. It is also where we hold information that we are working with at the moment. The working memory have a certain number of slots that keep the information we are working with. When the slots are full, we cannot process anything more. The exact number of slots are debated, everything from seven plus minus two down all the way to three or even maybe just four slots. And the total amount of information uh, that the working memory can hold at one time is called cognitive load. And if you get too much information and run out of slots, that's when you get cognitive overload and then you can't take in any more information and might miss important parts. When using our working memory, we constantly relate the information there to the information in the schemas in the long-term memory. And the more you recall and use a memory, the better consolidated it gets. Uh, even though it also will be altered and changed when you are working with it. Schemas uh, that are highly practiced take less space in the working memory. And if a schema is automated, it barely takes any space at all. So for example, if you for a LARP tries to learn how to fight with foam swords, so-called buffer fighting, it is very hard in the start you need to think about exactly how you stand, how you move, how to hold the foam sword in the right way. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. And after a while, you can do it without even thinking about it. And you can instead focus on your opponent and your surroundings. 
it becomes automated and it takes less space. So things we know well take less space and are easier to use. This brings us to chunking. Chunking is to group individual pieces of information into larger meaningful units. And then that larger unit will take one slot. So with the example of buffer fighting, after a while, you will have shunk the information together into larger units. And you can remember a fighting stance instead of having to remember every single detail about what that stance entails, exactly how to stand and the angle, you just know it. Apparently, stories are something we seem to be better at remembering than many other things. Yeah, then Fosch speculates that this might be because stories are supposed to create meaning and that maybe it is this meaning making that are the reason that we seem to remember them better. Stories also help us understand the causation between information and context. So it's not just understanding information in a context, but between information and context. And role playing games are about creating stories. When using role playing games in teaching, the debrief is highlighted as very important for the intended learning to happen and for helping with contextualizing the knowledge. I would suggest that this is a type of analogy. We are connecting what happened in the LARP with other contexts. When forming analogies, we understand how different things are similar because they share the same relational structure. Analogies are about abstract relations and they help us with constructing meaning, just like stories. Analogical reasoning is a cognitive underpinning of the ability to notice and draw similarities across contexts. And this all seems very important for transfer. So transfer is about applying what you've learned in one context in another context. And for me, it makes sense that understanding how information relates to context that stories seem to do, and to be able to draw the connections to other contexts that analogies seem to do, would then help with also being able to apply the information in a new context. Evolutionary psychologists suggest that we humans also seem to be better at learning knowledge and skills that have been important for our survival as a species. And this could explain why we have an easier time to understand things that are social over things that are highly abstract. We are better at solving the same math problem when it's presented and phrased as a social situation than when it's purely abstract. And role playing games are social, even in their most basic form. OK, now you know a bit more about how the cognitive perspective looks at creating memories, how they are stored. But it isn't enough to just have them stored and learn them well. You also need to be able to retrieve a memory when you need it. You have probably been in the situation when you are watching a movie and you just can't remember the name of that actor on the screen. I mean, you know the name, but you just, it's like you can't reach it. And this is failing to recall the memory. So we need to both be able to store the information and to recall the information. And how strongly we have managed to encode the information will decide how quickly we forget the information, but also how fast we can relearn it while recalling decides how good we are at accessing the information. So for example, uh, if you look at really good chess players, they aren't reasoning, they are recalling. So when I play chess and I'm not very good at chess, I have to really process my way through it. If I move this pawn, then he might move his horse and then I can move my tower and then I can take this pawn and then maybe, and then, I don't remember where I started because I get cognitive overload and I can't process the amount of information. And it's not that professional chess players are better at doing this process or doing it faster. 
It's that they are actually grabbing previous shunked information from their existing schemas. They are recalling old uh, play sessions and use that information instead. When we learn something, we connect it to the situation we were in when learning it. We create little cues that we connect to the information. And these cues can help us trigger a memory. So maybe the smell of fire makes you think about LARP, for example. And these cues, they are like little hooks that you can latch onto when you try to retrieve your memory. This is called cue dependent learning and can help us with memory retrieval. And this brings us back to the fact that learning is context dependent. Because as I mentioned, we are usually not very good at retrieving information in a different context from when we learned it. There is a classic example uh, in the study Mathematics in the Street and School, uh, where they studied street children and they could see that they could do complicated math uh, mathematical calculations out in the street in their everyday life. But when they were put in a school, in a classroom, they couldn't solve the same kind of calculations. Because learning is context dependent, we get a problem with the transfer. The good thing is that when you know about it, you can use it. So if you want to learn something for a very specific context, this means you should study it in a context as close to the one where you're going to need it as possible. So for example, if you are going to a LARP out in a forest and you want to learn the names of the different fractions, the names of the other characters and so on, you preferably should do that in a forest when maybe wearing your LARP costume or being together with your friends that you are going, to, uh, going with to the LARP. And this will then help with being able to recall the information in the situation where you will need it. But a lot of the time when we learn something or when we want to teach something, we want the knowledge to be available in many contexts. We don't want school children to only be able to use what they know in the classroom. We want them to be able to use it in life, right? Hence the transfer problem. So what we need to do is to make the knowledge less context dependent. And one way to do this is to create more cues to help us retrieve the information. And how do we do that? The more different situations you are in when learning, the more cues, and there is a chance that some of these cues are relevant in the context where you need the information. And it doesn't get as strongly attached to a specific one. So the more cues, the less context dependent the knowledge becomes. And this could include things like study what you want to learn at the different, different times of the day, in different settings, with different smells, different people around you, in different emotional states, and so on. And for me, this is super exciting in relation to role-playing games, because in role-playing games, we add another layer, and therefore more potential cues. So, if you learned about geometry in a science fiction LARP in a forest, you might be able to recall information about geometry when you are out taking a walk in a forest, when someone starts talking about space, or when you are cold instead of primarily in a classroom. So role-playing games might make it easier to remember what you have learned because it's a story help understand the causation between information and context through analogies, help us create meaning, help us understand new knowledge easier because it's social, and help with creating more cues so we also can retrieve what we have learned. And this is why I think role-playing games might be a good tool for transfer. It would be really interesting to see if this actually do applies to role playing games and in that case how, but to find that out, we will need a lot further research. Here are my references. And thank you for listening. <laughs>